one. Can we just do a quick technical check to see if everybody can um, hear audio? Apologies, my laptop's audio is working and not in this room. <laughs> So um, can we just get, oh, thank you. We've got the responses. Thank you very much. So welcome again to a, another um, Zoom session, an NIH COVID-19 training session. Um, and in this uh, instance, in collaboration with the Wits Health Consortium and with the support of the Health and Welfare Center. So greetings, everybody. Um, we are going to be joined soon by a representative of the uh, Wits Health Consortium, and uh, that is uh, uh, Mr. Sagi Pele, and we're just waiting for him to log on. Um, in the meantime, uh, the National Health Laboratory Services, our overall mother body, and the NIH um, is very pleased to bring you this particular session. Uh, dealing with the responsibilities of employers during COVID-19. Um, and uh, we have a, a special guest apart from our own presenters, and I'll introduce uh, later on Dr. Lucas Mosidi of the Compensation Fund. Um, and today I think is our 28th or 29th session, Glenn, um, uh, starting in March, and we've managed to uh, even max the thousand uh, logins on the Zoom session. The series is dealing, the COVID-19 series dealing with a whole lot of topics uh, that covers workplace preparedness and prevention, uh, but also deals with the after the fact scenario if there may have been an exposure and an infection, but most importantly emphasizing prevention and the containment measures within the workplace. Um, so We'll be conducting this COVID-19 session and um, uh, the responsibility of employers. It follows on uh, the issue of the role of worker representatives. And it also follows on the importance of the role of management and ensuring that the health and safety of employees and the fellow workers, as well as customers and visitors are in fact addressed. So it's uh, wonderful for us to engage with you via the Zoom platform in this current context. And we are pleased with this collaboration with the Vissal Consortium and the Health and Welfare CETA uh, to make this possible over a period of three months. So all our presentations are available to you via our website. That's www.nih.ac.za. And we encourage you to visit the website. It is zero rated by the major mobile uh, cell phone providers in South Africa and internet and a few internet provide internet service providers. Um, you'll find all the presentations of our sessions there, video and audio recordings, as um, as well as the other resource materials, the protocols, uh, the um, posters, infographics, etc. Um, it's, there's a wealth of resources at www.nih.ac.za. Um, you will also find us on Twitter, and I'll give the Twitter handle to you uh, later on in this session. Um, so this session's recording will also be uploaded um, soon after these uh, Zoom session is done. In a, a, over a day or two, you'll find it on the website. Um, so thank you for joining. And on behalf of the NIH team and the Wits Health Consortium and the Health and Welfare Center, we welcome you to today's session. Um, so, if Glenn, you can just check if uh, Mr. Pillay is on. Okay, thank you very much, Glenn. So, can I just orientate you to the, um, the program for today? Um, that's the program entitled uh, COVID-19 Training Session for managers, what are the responsibilities of employers during COVID-19? Um, uh, we will be having an introduction on behalf of the Wits Health Consortium by Mr. Play as soon as he's online. Then our first presenter from the NIOH um, is the National She uh, Deputy Manager, and that's uh, Michelle Morgan. Michelle is going to deal with the legislative roles and responsibilities of the employers. 
That's followed by current decree, uh, also from the NIH, our occupational hygiene section, and a current will be dealing with what employees need to implement in response to COVID-19. We have already been joined by Dr. Lucas Mosidi, he is online from the Department of Employment and Labor's Compensation Fund, and uh, Dr. Mosidi will deal with compensation for COVID-19 diseases under the COID Act. And at the end, we'll have our question and answer sessions. Now, just a bit of log uh, logistics, a bit of admin. You will see at the bottom of your screen is a Q&A bubble, right? Please only type your questions in that Q&A box. The other box, the chat box over there, where I see some comments already, is for general comments and inquiries. We will only be dealing with questions in the Q&A box. And if you have typed something in the chat box, we're going to ask you to trans copy and transfer your question into the Q&A box. We have a group of panelists of the National Institute for Occupational Health, the NIH, who's going to answer your questions live during the session. So if your question is in the first column, the question session, if it's answered, it will move to the answered section. Um, please do not make general comments in the Q&A um, and greeting and, um, you know, the, the hello and the thanks comments. Keep that to the chat section. Um, so you click on your, on your Q&A uh, icon, it'll pop up and it'll allow you to type your question and you can type your questions to panelists only or you can type your questions to panelists and to the other participants and that would be encouraged. So uh, now I um, need to just check if uh, uh, Dr. Play is on. Okay, so once... Once we have um, uh, that logged on, I need to um, also welcome Dr. Uh, Mr. Sagi Pele. Uh, uh, Sagi, Mr. Pele, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, so I've done the, uh, oh yes, and, and, and also very importantly, we will share with you the number which is the NIH hotline for any queries that you may have um, regarding COVID-19 in your workplace, the return to work, the workplace preparedness and prevention, and in the case where there may be a suspected or actual tested positive case, um, what are the steps to follow with regard to that? We have a very useful um, protocol as well as the uh, screening form that is available on our website and that will give you an idea of how uh, you could ensure that your workplace, um, your employees returning to work or arriving at work and customers are regularly checked. I'm going to move on to um, uh, Sagi Play. Can, can you hear us? Yes, I can, uh, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Colleagues, good morning. Uh, my name is Segi Pele. I'm the uh, Chief Operating Officer for the Bits Health Consortium. I, I'll just take up a minute or two of your time. I mean, firstly, um, in addition to the earlier welcome, a very warm welcome to you, uh, all the participants on this particular program. I wanted to share a couple of things. Um, firstly, you know, we're very uh, privileged that these sessions are possible through funding from the Health and Welfare CETA. And I must say the Health and Welfare CETA has been absolutely phenomenal in uh, responding to the request to provide these uh, critical uh, training programs, these webinars. And there's gonna be several uh, offered over the, the, hello. Yes, proceed, we can hear you. Oh, I lost you, uh, the picture went off. So there'll be several uh, offered in partnership with, uh, with the National Institute for Occupational Health over the next uh, three months until the end of August. We've identified uh, together with the experts, which is uh, NIOH, several topics that are relevant to employers and to employees. 
to prepare the workplaces and to ensure that the workplaces are safe for the returning uh, millions of workers that have started uh, from last week. And these programs are really to provide uh, some knowledge, to provide some skills, and most importantly, we hope that uh, with the participants that are involved, that you will continue to play a critical role in terms of changing behaviors. It's absolutely crucial that we now learn to live with this virus. It's gonna be a long time before uh, we get back to any sense of normality if there ever is gonna be normality again. So the more important thing is for us to be able to learn to live with the virus and to continue our lives in the best way that we can. And, and of course, most importantly, to ensure that we're protecting ourselves and we're protecting our colleagues and we're protecting our families and the rest of the community. So the programs have been developed in, in that particular way. It, it's developed to provide some information, it's developed to, to provide uh, knowledge about the regulations that are in place. It's, it is designed to provide, uh, uh, to, to, to give you all of the steps to ensure that workplaces are safe and, and the like. So we're, we're really proud and very privileged to be part of a, a, a reputable and prestigious organization. Uh, the National Institute for Occupational Health. We're also pleased that we're doing this in partnership with the Health and Welfare CETA. Uh, but unfortunately, because the funding comes from the Health and Welfare CETA, uh, the participants, um, the, uh, while it's open to others, but in terms of getting data support, because we recognize that not everyone has access to, to um, to free data or to, uh, to uh, sites, et cetera, in the places of employ. Um, so the Health and Welfare CETA has made data available to enable people to participate in the program. But that data is limited to only uh, employers in the Health and Welfare CETA. So anyone else who participates, uh, you know, unfortunately at this point cannot get access to the data. While you may be able to participate in the program, but you'll have to get, uh, you know, either use uh, um, uh, Wi-Fi, et cetera, at the workplaces, or you're going to have to carry your own. But we are going to have a discussion with the Health and Welfare CETA to see whether or not it could be ex extended to other CETAs, or at least to get other CETAs to also co-fund this. But there's a second problem that I wanted to raise, and I and I and I raise this mainly because we we all also have a responsibility to ensure that we use these privileges in a very responsible way. The last session, unfortunately, uh, you know, we download the data for individuals who require the data about an hour before the program. And unfortunately, for the last session, we had, we had over 500 people that were interested. And the moment we downloaded the data, the number of people who participated uh, reduced by, by, by 52%. So I, I just make an appeal that, you know, we, we're very fortunate that funding has been made available and that we've made this funding available to ensure that uh, the most important thing is that we get this knowledge and these skills out to all of the right people. And, then, and therefore we must take responsibility and we must ensure that we all act responsible. Now I know the people that are on this program are, 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 are not the parties that are abusing it, but I, I'd really appeal to you that when you're talking to your colleagues and you're talking to future participants, et cetera, please encourage them to use that. So those, and, and there may be very good reasons why people didn't participate in the last session. So I certainly again make the appeal that if you're not then NIOH is uh, repeating some of these sessions to ensure that we get as, as, as much coverage as possible. So again, for those participants, and if you know some of them, please encourage them to participate in future ones using the data that was already uh, provided. Otherwise, it makes it extremely difficult and, and it denies other individuals the opportunity if we have to start looking at other ways in which we can control the data. So I, I just make a personal appeal and an organizational appeal that you know we all act responsibly in this very, very uh, difficult time. But, um, uh, but again, thank you very much for, for participating in the program. 
The important thing is get the message out. We, we need to train six, uh, 23,000 people over the next three months. So get the message out to your colleagues that they should also participate in this. Uh, you'll get the contact details, et cetera, that the, that the facilitator will provide. And, and, and uh, we'd appeal to you to become partners with us in this uh, particular program. Chair, th those are my, my few words from my side. I thank you very much for this opportunity uh, and uh, best wishes for the rest of the program. Thank you very much. That was uh, Mr. Sagi Pillay, the representative of the Wits Health Consortium. Uh, that's part of this partnership and he's the Chief Operations Officer at the Versailles Consortium um, that has initiated this particular program over the three months. Thank you very much for that. So a quick reminder before we move to our first presenter, you have the Q&A section here at the bottom. Please use that box to ask your questions. Only general comments you will have here in the chat one um, on the other side. We have already received a question that deals with first aid within the context of COVID-19 for non-COVID-19 related incident and hopefully that's one of the questions that can be answered and move over from the open questions over to the answered questions as we proceed. We do have a panel of uh, people who are not presenting who are um, competent to look at the questions being asked. I now welcome our first presenter and that is Michelle Morgan from the NIH's uh, uh, the SHE, the National Deputy Managing the SHE Department, that's going to deal with legislated roles and responsibility of employees. Thank you very much, Michelle. Welcome. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for making the time to attend this presentation. As the Chair has mentioned, uh, my name is Michelle Morgan and I am the Deputy Manager for the National Safety, Health and Environment um, Department. And uh, my presentation this morning is on the legislated roles and responsibilities of employers. I will begin by introducing to you the OSH Act. Uh, the Occupational Health and Safety Act 85 of 1993 is, uh, came into effect on the 1st of January 1994. The OSH Act has 50 sections and various different regulations. OSH legislation is published by the Department of Labor, Employment and Labor, and one of their functions is to regulate the South African labor market. And they do this through inspections, compliance, monitoring, and enforcement. Therefore, it is essential that every workplace comply with the requirements of the OSH Act. This is just a screenshot of what the OSH Act looks like. What is the aim of the OSH Act? The aim of the act is to pro provide for the health and safety of persons at work, provide for the health and safety of persons in connection with the use of plant and machinery, protection of persons other than protect persons at work against hazards to health and safety arising out of or in connection with the activities of persons at work, and lastly, to establish an advisory council for occupational health and safety. If you are familiar with the, with the OSH Act, you will notice that um, the words reasonably practicable are used constantly throughout the Act. Just to give you a little bit of background, reasonably practicable is a legal term used to describe what you can do, what you are able to reasonably do to ensure the health and safety of workers. And remember, what you are reasonably able to do will be um, influenced by the severity and scope of the hazard or risk concerned. The state of knowledge reasonably available concerning that hazard or risk. The availability and suitability of means to remove or mitigate that hazard or risk 
And lastly, and most importantly, the cost of removing or mitigating that hazard or risk. I'm now moving on to the sections of the OSH Act. Remember I said there's 50 sections, but I'm going to highlight the most uh, important and pertinent ones uh, due to time constraints. Um, section 17 of the OSH Act is the health and safety policy. This is a written policy concerning the protection of the health and safety of employees at work. What it includes is a description of the organization and the arrangements for carrying out and reviewing that policy. So it's a written statement of the principles and goals embodying the company's commitment to workplace health and safety. Now the health and safety policy statement is a brief statement that describes the organization. This is a statement that is prominently displayed at all workplaces and it is signed by the CEO. It is a control document which has the date and the next date of review. Section eight is general duties of employers to their employees. Every employer shall provide and maintain as far as reasonably practicable, a working environment that is safe and without risk to the health of the employees. So just going to a little bit more detail of the general duties of the employer, the provision and maintenance of systems of work, plant and machinery that is safe and without risk to health. Eliminate or mitigate any hazard or potential hazard. Ensure the safety and absence of risks to health. Establish what hazards are attached to any work which is performed. Establish what precautionary measures should be taken. Provide information, instructions, training, and supervision. Take all the necessary measures to ensure that the requirements of this act are complied with. Ensure that work is performed and plant or machinery is used under supervision. So if you take note of the slide, I have highlighted the word safe, risk, health, eliminate, mitigate, hazard, and again, safe, risk, health. So if I move on to the next slide, you will see that the foundation of any health and safety program is actually the risk assessment. It is the primary management tool that is used in ensuring that the health and safety of workers are maintained. A risk assessment is defined as the process of assessing the risks associated with the hazards identified so that appropriate control measures can be put in place to eliminate or mitigate the risk to protect the health and safety of workers. Every workplace, irrespective of whether it's a hospital, a lab, office, a workshop, etc., must ensure that there is a risk assessment in place. For every risk that is identified, appropriate risk control measures must be selected and implemented to mitigate the residual risk to an acceptable level. The approved risk assessment must be recorded and communicated to all staff. Staff must read and familiarize themselves with the contents of this risk assessment. This is just um, the hierarchy of control in terms of the controls that put in place in the procedure of conducting the risk assessment. As men mentioned, lastly, it will be the measures that will be put in place, right? So uh, moving on to section 14. Section 14 is the general duties of employees at, employees at work. Okay, I think. I actually think there's a slide missing. There's, I could have made a mistake there. Section eight is the general duties of employers. And all the duties of employers actually encompass what the risk assessment entails. 
So it is to implement uh, a work environment that is safe and without risk to the health and safety of the employee, to take steps to identify risks, to put control measures in place, and to um, ensure that employee, employees are working under supervision, constant supervision, provide PPE and other controls necessary for creating and maintaining a workplace that is safe and healthy for all employees. Section 14 is the general duties of employees at work. So like I said, the employer has certain duties. Likewise, the employee has certain duties as well. One of them is to take care of the health and safety of himself and of others who may be affected by his acts or omissions. Carry out any lawful order and obey health and safety rules and procedures laid down by the employer. Report any situation which is unsafe or unhealthy to the employer or to the health and safety representative. Report any incident which may affect his health or has caused an injury to himself. Report such incident to the health and safety rep no later than the end of that shift. Moving on to section 16. Section 16 deals with the chief executive officer charged with certain duties. Every CEO shall, as far as reasonably practicable, ensure that the duties of his employer are as contemplated in the OSH Act are properly discharged. The CEO can assign any duty to any person under the, his control, and this is known as a Section 16.2 legal appointment. But you would see that it says without derogating from his responsibility or liability. In other words, whilst the CEO can assign these duties, the CEO will still remain responsible and accountable. So I'm assuming that most attendees here today are managers. So when I make reference to the employer, it is actually you who is the 16.2 appointee. Moving on to section 17, it is the health and safety representatives. Who should have health and safety representatives? It's employers who have more than 20 employees at a workplace. How must these rep be appointed? They must be appointed in writing and they must be appointed for a specific period. Who is eligible to be a safety rep? It's only employees that are full time and also it must be an employee that is fully acquainted with the conditions and activities of that workplace. How many health and safety reps should there be? For shops and offices, we say one, the act says one for every 100. All other workplaces, one for every 50. When are activities conducted? All activities in connection with the designation, functions, and training must be performed during ordinary working hours. What are the functions? Sorry? What are the functions of the health and safety representative? Firstly, to review the effectiveness of health and safety measures, identify potential hazards and potential major incidents, examine the causes of incidents in the workplace, investigate complaints, inspect the workplace, participate in consultation with inspectors, receive information from inspectors, and attend health and safety committee meetings. So your employer would have a health and safety system in place where there would be policies, there would be SOPs and procedures, and all of these functions will be encompassed in the duties of the health and safety rep for your particular facility. So you would see review effectiveness of the, of the measures. It will be basically doing your risk assessment, identifying hazards, also part of your risk assessment, 
examining the causes of incidents. That would be incident investigations. Um, investigating complaints by employees. That would probably be um, taking complaints and tabling them at a safety committee uh, meeting. Inspecting the workplace. That would be your um, health and safety quarterly inspections, etc. right? So moving on to health and safety committees. When is a committee established? It's established when you have two or more safety reps, right? Who are the members of the committee? It's all the reps that are appointed, a person nominated by the employer, at least one representative from management should be on the committee with the authority to act on behalf of the employer. And an advisory member by reason of their knowledge and skills on health and safety matters. How often do meetings take place? By law, they need to take place at least once every three months. Moving on to the functions of the committee. The committee makes recommendations to the employer regarding any matter affecting the health and safety of persons at work. They discuss incidents at the workplaces and they also discuss how the incident was investigated, what control measures have been put in place in order to prevent the incident from occurring, re recurring. They must, as I mentioned, there must be a system in place for recording any recommendation, and this is part of the functions of the Health and Safety Committee. The Health and Safety Committee or member thereof shall not incur any civil liability. Section 24 deals with the reporting to the inspector regarding certain incidents. In this case, we are referring to incidents that are um, major incidents where a person dies, becomes unconscious, suffers the loss of a limb or part of the limb, or where a major incident, a spillage, an explosion, something like this occurred. This must be immediately reported to the inspector in writing on the day of the incident. <clears throat> Moving on to the, say, the regulations of the OSH Act, I'm just going to go through them briefly. Firstly, we have the general safety regulation. Here, this regulation deals with personal safety equipment and facilities. So the employer is responsible for providing, for maintaining, and for cleaning personal protective equipment that the employee needs. They're also responsible for providing training that is required um, to, for the employee to give a use, how to use the equipment correctly and how to um, decontaminate or reuse if it's reusable equipment. Moving on to intoxication, intoxicated per persons should not be allowed entry. Admit admittance of persons, there should be unauthorized access prohibition signs throughout the organization in terms of only who is allowed to uh, enter. First aid, emergency equipment and procedures. Here we're referring to first aid kits, firefighting equipment, eye wash stations, and safety showers. This regulation will give you in-depth knowledge and guidelines as to what you require in terms of numbers, quantities, um, uh, location, et cetera, of all the safety equipment and facilities. Moving on to general administrative regulations. Here, we, uh, they cover the copy of the act. This must be available to employees. Uh, it must be accessible. And um, reporting of incidents and occupational diseases. This covers the reporting of accidents. These must be done on a, a WCL2 form. An employer's report of an occupational disease must be done on a WCL1 form. These must be record, uh, reported to the compensation commissioner. <clears throat> Recording and investigation of incidents, as I mentioned, there must be a protocol in place where um, it, it gives uh, employees step-by-step -step instructions on how to report an incident in the workplace. Uh, these uh, records must be kept in writing. Every incident must be investigated so that control measures are put in place 
to prevent the in incident from occurring again. This is just a screenshot of the COID Act, the Compensation for Occupational Injuries and Disease Act. Moving on to facilities regulation. These are the important uh, aspects of the facilities regulation. The employer needs to ensure that their sanitation facilities, facilities for safekeeping, change rooms separate for males and females, dining facilities, prohibition, these are notices that need to be displayed at, um, in hazardous workplaces, prohibiting eating, drinking, uh, applying of cosmetics, etc. Drinking water and adequate supply must be available, clean drinking water. Seats, ergonomically sound seats with backrests must be provided for all employees and conditions of rooms and facilities. These must, rooms and facilities at the workplace must be maintained in a clean, hygienic, safe, whole and leak-free condition. Lastly, I'm going to just um, briefly outline the regulations for hazardous biological agents. An HBA is a microorganism, including those that have been genetically modified, pathogens, cells, cell cultures, and human endoparasites. So a virus, a bacteria, parasite, etc., falls into the category of an HBA. An HBA has specific guidelines, and these include information and training. So before a person is required to work with an HBA, they must be trained on the potential risks thereof. They must be provided with safe working protocols. There must be a, a, a given guidelines on the precautions to be taken and the procedures in case of an exposure. The duties of the person that might be exposed, that person too has um, responsibilities in terms of following protocol, wearing PPE, reporting for medical examinations, and reporting exposures, etc. The risk assessment also forms part of this regulation where, as I mentioned, it encompasses identifying hazards and evaluating risks, and a risk assessment must be reviewed every two years. Medical surveillance, you must provide employees if result, with medical surveillance if the results of the risk assessment deem it necessary. Records for <clears throat> employees dealing with hazardous biological agents must be kept for a minimum of 40 years. This includes your risk assessment records, your medical surveillance records, any tests done, biological monitoring, etc. Lastly, I'd like to just introduce you to the NIOH website. If you're not already familiar with it, this is how you can access it. And we have a wealth of information, resources, fact sheets, guidelines, etc. I'd like to acknowledge assistance from the Safety, Health and Environment Department and the NIOH Outbreak Response Team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. And that was Michelle Morgan, the um, Deputy Manager of the Safety, Health and Environment Department, the National um, Deputy Manager, uh, dealing with legislative roles and the responsibilities of employers. A reminder, please uh, type your questions in the Q&A box and only general comments in the chat section. Our next presenter is Karen Dupree of the NIH's Occupational Hygiene Section. And uh, Karen will deal with what employers need to implement in response to COVID-19. Thank you very much, Karen. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Michelle dealt with uh, the general requirements of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. I will take it one step further, looking at what employers need to do um, and to implement in the workplace in response specifically to COVID-19. Um, as mentioned, the duty of the employer is to implement preventative measures at workplaces to ensure a safe and healthy work environment for all employees. 
This is dealt with in detail in the Occupational Health and Safety Act. In this current response, also there's a lot of additional documentation that's been published on um, that will be legislation, uh, regulations, directions, guidelines to give specific information. The one we will touch on today specifically is the Consolidated COVID-19 Direction on Health and Safety in the Workplace. This is the update that was issued on Thursday, the 4th of June, so it's brand spanking new. And it's applicable for the duration of the state of disaster and then until it's been updated. What we've seen now with this situation is as information um, is updated, as new information gets available and as the situation develops, information is updated continuously. Therefore, the most important thing any employer can do is to make sure that they are up to date with the, um, with the up-to-date documentation as it is published. Um, currently, there are some sector-specific regulations available already that was issued under the regulations under the Disaster Management Act. These, um, as I say, keep your eye on the websites because uh, uh, these are updated and they are new um, sector-specific regulations that will be issued as time go on. Um, the consolidated direction that I'm talking about in Annex B, it specifically gives the aspects that need to be included uh, in these um, sector-specific regulations. Um, the Department of Health's website and then its specific resource and news portal um, always have also provide the links to all of these regulations. This is just so at um, guidelines and uh, at the guidelines link, you will get regulations and directions that is updated as they go on. This is the one that was gazetted on the 4th of June and it's called then the Consolidated COVID-19 Direction on Health and Safety in the Workplace. And extra A to these, um, to this uh, provides also links to all of the documentation that is referenced in this specific document. So Michelle mentioned specifically about the risk assessment that need to be conducted in each and every workplace. This risk assessment should be reviewed then usually at least once in two years but also, if the current assessment is no longer valid, um, if there was maybe any of the control measures that are not effective anymore, if any advances allow for more effective control measures to be introduced, and also if there's been any change in the work methods, the type of work carried out, or the type of equipment used. Uh, the risk assessment also needs to be updated when an incident occurs or occupational diseases is diagnosed and when, if and when any additional hazard or risk was identified or introduced into the workplace. Therefore, any workplace where there is an existing risk assessment, the risk assessment needs to be reviewed to include the risk to COVID-19. So when you look at the risk assessment, how do you go about, what are you going to do? The first step will be to identify any work task or area where transmission can occur. Um, this will be, when you look at your workplace, any area where people maybe can come into close contact with each other, be it employees or employees towards customers or the public, and any areas that are used by um, many people or um, surfaces that are touched by many people. Specifically look at things like doorknobs, um, tea rooms, canteens, any area, also your um, hygiene facilities, any area. So all of those areas where there's a potential for transmission, those areas must be identified. Um, it's also very important to identify vulnerable workers. 
the Department, uh, Department of Health issued a specific guidance on vulnerable workers, um, giving you guidance on how to identify who is a vulnerable worker and then the measures to put in place. The risk for each task or area need to be assessed individually. You can have um, five persons, that's administrative assistants, but each of them has got a different, um, different tasks that they perform in a day, so their risk may differ, even though they have the same job description. So it's extremely important to assess each and every task individually to make sure that details are not missed and people and, and the possible risk is not under or overestimated. Identify the suitable control measures. This will include the, um, the need for PPE um, for each task or area according to the risk rating. There is a lot of guidelines on this as well. Uh, on this, as I say, it's very important to make sure that you go to the websites um, on a regular basis and look at the guidelines um, and the fact sheets or guidance documents that is available. It's necessary to consider any additional hazard that was introduced in response to COVID-19. So that can be the chemicals that you use for disinfection. As with any chemical that you introduce in the workplace, it's important to look at the safety data sheet. How can it be used? How, um, what is the um, precautions to take? and how to work safely with it. Also prolonged use of PPE, if that can cause any additional hazard or risk to the user. And then stress, anxiety and depression that should be dealt with to identify and address. I think um, in a situation like this, transparency is extremely important and employees need to feel that their concerns are addressed. So it's extremely important for the employer not to ignore any possible risk or any possible uh, um, feeling or um, observation that his employees might have, but to, to have open channel of communication and address this so that the employees can be at ease. And then review the risk assessment when any changes to work um, processes occur and also then following a confirmed case of COVID-19 at the workplace. We will discuss that a little bit in detail later. This is just the guidance document on vulnerable employees. It specifically um, addresses who is a vulnerable employee in the context of COVID-19 how to identify a vulnerable employee, as, um, assessing a vulnerable employee, protecting and managing vulnerable employees in the workplace, and then return to work and incapacity management. With regards to the consolidated COVID-19 um, direction that we are discussing here, um, the direction discusses everything that an employer in a general workplace need to implement. We're not going to have time to go in detail through all of it, but refer to the document and refer to the documents that's referenced in there. It gives a lot of information. The, the important thing or the starting point is that for any business, when any business is permitted to commence, um, the employer must conduct a risk assessment and then develop a return to work plan, outlining exactly uh, what is the protective measures that will be put in place, and then um, to facilitate return, uh, phased return of employees based then on the risk assessment. So the starting point will always be the risk assessment uh, to, to make sure what is the risk associated with each and every task, and then how to manage it to make sure that employees can return in a safe manner. The um, employer need to consult with trade unions if they are uh, uh, represented in the work area and the health and safety committee, or if the health and safety committee is not established, then the health and safety representative. And this plan must be available for inspection by an inspector or then any of the representatives uh, mentioned above. 
This plan must include the date when um, you plan on reopening the business plus then the business hours. It must have a list of the employees that will be permitted to return to work plus those that will be required to work from home. Uh, it must include a plan and timetable for phased in return. It must identify vulnerable workers. It must include measures to minimize the number of workers at the workplace at a time and also include the workplace protective measures. And um, there it's very important to re um, refer to the specific um, sectoral guidelines, directions and guidance documents uh, for your specific sector then. Measures for daily screening of the employees must also be addressed, as well as screening for clients, visitors, or contractors, where that is applicable. And um, the details of the appointed COVID-19 compliance officer. This is in terms of clause 20.6 of this direction. There's a requirement uh, um, to appoint a compliance officer. We will talk about that in a moment as well. Um, so we said that that is the plan, um, the return to work plan that must be established. Then the administrative measures that must be implemented. This again, you see how important it is. Always we'll start with a risk assessment. If there is um, more than 500 employees in the workplace, this risk assessment as well as a written policy on your preventative measures need to be um, submitted to the Health and Safety Committee as well as the Department of Employment and Labour within 21 days of commencement of this direction. So it needs to be done. Um, it must think, uh, you must address special measures for vulnerable workers. As per the guideline, I showed you it does include uh, measures how to protect your vulnerable workers. As with any uh, um, situation in the, or any of the regulations in the Occupational Health and Safety Act, the requirement for information and training is extremely important. So you must always, you must inform your employees of the applicable legislation, the directions that you're following, the um, regulations, everything applicable to your specific workplace, and what is the measures that you implemented to make sure that the organization adhere to this uh, legislation. Employees must be informed on the dangers of the virus, the manners of um, transmission and the measures implemented to prevent it. So that will, um, that will include personal hygiene measures, distancing, cough etiquette, the wearing of masks, and also information on where to go for and how, what to do in, um, when it's necessary to be screened or tested. This information and training can be done through, um, or it can be complemented with leaflets or notices that can be displayed in the workplace. Also part of the administrative measures would be um, that employees should know that they must stay at home when they display symptoms associated with COVID-19 and should take the, uh, make use of the um, sick leave in such instances and not report for work. Um, the manager that must be appointed, so, so the direction requires that a manager must be appointed as the COVID-19 compliance officer and the duties will be. So this is an additional appointment that needs to be made in terms of, as we said, uh, um, clause 20.6 of this specific direction and it will be applicable for as long as the uh, um, state of disaster is declared and is applicable. His duties will then be for this specific appointment to oversee the implementation of the plan, to oversee adherence to the health and safety measures. There's also a provision that he can then appoint other employees uh, to perform these functions to oversee the adherence to the health and safety measures if there is one, uh, more than one workplace applicable to this organization. And he must address the concerns and ensure that employees are kept informed and also consult with the health and safety committee where that is applicable in a workplace. Um, the employer needs to ensure that compliance to all of these measures that are implemented are done through monitoring and supervision. 
We must minimize the number of employees at the workplace. There you can implement shift regimes, uh, rotation, remote working arrangements as applicable, and um, to minimize contact between employees and also between employees and the public. The, uh, this direction also addresses specifically what to do in case a worker is diagnosed with COVID-19. And there's specifically three things that need to happen. You need to report it to the Department of, um, of Health. That would be through the hotline and also to the Department of Employment and Labour. Then you must investigate if this could have happened due to a failure in the control measures and then revise the risk assessment. And there must be, uh, um, you must determine then if there is a need to temporarily close um, this work area in order to decontaminate. So that will all uh, be based on this specific situation to make sure what need to be implemented to make sure that workers then can remain safe and return safely to work. Um, also, the direction discusses social distancing measures. Um, the employer needs to arrange the workplace to maintain at least at one and a half meters between workers at all times. Where this is not possible, physical barriers need to, um, need to be implemented to make sure that workers can do their work safely. Um, when required, also supply employees with the appropriate um, personal protective equipment. This will be as was identified through the risk assessment. As I said, every specific task needs to be assessed um, individually to make sure where, what is the appropriate PPE to be used in each specific area. Um, the employer must ensure that the measures are implemented through supervision. And this must include the workplaces themselves, but also the common areas. So canteens, hygiene facilities, areas um, in the, immediately outside the workplace, make sure that, um, that those social distancing um, measures are, uh, um, are adhered to. Um, also staggered break times can be implemented um, where possible to avoid crowding in the common areas. The health and safety measures that's described in, the, um, in this direction covers these specific topics, the symptom screening, sanitizers, cloth masks, measures for workplaces to which public, um, the, the public have access, ventilation, and then specific personal protective equipment. I'm not gonna deal with each of them um, in detail. Uh, we're going to look at some of them. So with regards to symptom screening, the requirement is that every employee must be screened for the symptoms uh, um, when he reports to work. So that can be via uh, um, a questionnaire, um, whatever is implemented in that workplace, but to make sure every day uh, and uh, with also the responsibility to the employee to self-report whenever they have uh, or if they present with any symptoms. So this must happen when they report to work, but if they start experiencing symptoms while they are at work, employees have the duty to immediately inform the employer of that. Um, the employer must comply with the um, Department of Health guidelines on symptom monitoring and management. It's one of the documents that's also referenced in Annex A to the directions. The specific requirements, the specific requirements that's listed, if a worker presents with, um, with or reports symptoms, what the employer needs to do, the steps to follow to make sure that this person is isolated and then transported uh, to the required, be it for self-isolation or then uh, to, be, uh, to be tested. And requirements, there's also requirements on when to allow a worker that has been diagnosed with COVID-19 to return to work and the requirements if a worker has been in contact at the workplace with another worker who has been diagnosed. Um, that will require assessing whether it poses a low or a high risk and then the specific measures that need to be implemented there. 
Um, the sanitizers and disinfectants, as we all know by now, it's the responsibility of the employer to supply hand sanitizer for use by all employees. This will also include if employees are required to, to travel um, to see um, patients or whatever the case may be, or uh, clients or customers or the public, but, but not at the physical workplace itself only. Any work situation, any anywhere where the employee goes to perform his work and sanitizer must be available available for his use um, work surfaces and equipment and any common use areas must be disinfected before regularly during and after work where possible biometric systems must be disabled um, all measures must be implemented for their safe use if in any way possible um, ensure the availability of adequate hand wash facilities with so clean water and then the requirement is for the use of only paper towels and not cloth towels at the workplace. And it's the employer's responsibility to ensure that employees make use of all of these measures that's implemented. The use of cloth masks, as we know now, is, um, is a requirement whenever you are in a public place Employers must provide every employee with at least two cloth masks. This is um, specified in this direction um, and these must comply. There's also a requirement or a Department of Health um, a document on cloth masks. Um, and this is for use at work. That will be if other uh, respiratory protective equipment is not prescribed and then when commuting to and from work. Anyone entering the workplace, if it's a worker um, or a visitor, must wear a mask in the workplace. The, uh, the, the specific sectoral guidelines will um, give you information on the number or the replaceability of these. Um, and workers must be informed on how to use it correctly. And we, uh, what is just extremely important for me is that the risk of COVID-19 must be addressed and managed together with risks usually present at the workplace. Um, so if your risk assessment identified that um, you must wear a respirator, be it N95, be it FFP2, for the specific task that you are performing, you cannot now replace it with a cloth mask in any way. So that will mean your usual PPE will be worn while you're doing your work. When you go on your lunch break, you will take off and store your PPE as you would always do and then put on a cloth, cloth mask to go to the canteen. When you come back, you will um, put on your required PPE again to do your workplace. I think it's very important um, to ensure that. Any workplace where the public have access to the measures, the same measures will apply to make sure that the um, worker is protected from any exposure due to contact with the public and vice versa. So the employer needs to make sure that the number of people he allow inside his premises can be accommodated, uh, still allowing for at least 1.5 meters space. He must, uh, where, where necessary, he need to um, implement physical barriers. Where it's appropriate, symptom screening need to be done. Notices can be displayed. Um, and sanitizer need to be implemented. As So all the measures that we are familiar with to make sure it's applicable to um, ensure everybody's safety. There's a requirement for ventilation. So a workplace must be well ventilated by natural or mechanical means. Um, where it's reasonably, reasonably practicable, uh, local extraction ventilation can be um, implemented with HEPA filters, but when these are used, it's extremely important to ensure that the vents do not feed back through open windows. Um, and to ensure the regular cleaning and maintenance of these and replacement of filters by a competent person according to the manufacturer's instruction. Uh, we did talk about personal protective equipment. Please check the websites regularly and uh, where appropriate, the um, PPE that is accredited must be provided.
for workers. There's also requirements in the direction for um, small businesses with 10 or less employees. It's basically still the same. You will see it's a very similar, applicable then to a small, uh, smaller situation. The employee must provide, employer, sorry, must provide cloth masks or require the use of cloth masks or any covering of the mouth and nose while um, an employee is at work. You must still provide hand sanitizers, soap and clean water and disinfectants and you must ensure that this is used regularly. Um, you must also implement any additional me measures. Again, the risk assessment, even in a small workplace, it's very important to start with the risk assessment and whatever measures are identified need to be implemented to make sure the employees and public are safe in using his workplace. Um, as Michelle also mentioned, the workers have a responsibility and in this case, very important um, to make sure that they comply with the measures that's introduced by the employer as required by the specific direction. It's also important to note that, the, that there is um, clauses in this direction on the refusal of work due to exposure to COVID-19. So the employee has the right when he assesses, when he identifies, when he's concerned about the situation at the workplace to refuse work. But the, um, the um, responsibility is then, or his, his duty is then to report it immediately to his employer so that this, um, the situation can be assessed and measures as needed can be put into place. Um, the websites, uh, as I was saying, all the documentation that's referenced um, in the direction is um, referenced in Annex A to that. It's very important to regularly go to the um, visit the website and make sure that you get updated information. Michelle also mentioned the NIOH website uh, that's got a lot of information and also links to most of these documents that's referenced. Um, or, um, any questions to the NIOH can be posted to our um, to info at NIOH and there's a 24 hour hotline for workplace queries that's, that is still active. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Karen. Um, and that was uh, my colleague from the National Institute for Occupational Health, Occupational Hygiene section, um, dealing with the question of what employers need to implement in response to COVID-19. Thanks for that, Karen. Our next uh, presenter, is Dr. Lucas Mossidi from the Department of Employment and Labor's Compensation Fund. Uh, Dr. Mossidi, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you very well. Thank you very much. A welcome to this Zoom session on COVID-19 uh, for a trade managers in the public health and the social development sectors asking the question, what are the responsibilities of employers during COVID-19? And thank you for making yourself available to make a contribution on the compensation for COVID-19 disease under the uh, COID Act. Please proceed, uh, um, uh, Dr. Masidi. Do you have your presentation ready to share? Yes, uh, let's do this. Thank you very much, please proceed. Okay, are you able to see it clearly that side? Yes, sir. Uh, you may want to maximize it. It depends on how, what you feel comfortable with. Okay, yeah. Thank you. All right, thanks uh, very much. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Lucas Musidi. I'm the Director of Medical Services at the Compensation Fund. So 
the previous two uh, presenters have actually done a whole lot of uh, good job. So mine is to actually take over from where things now get a little bit messy. So you'll understand that as a compensation fund, we come at the end of the process when everything else has actually failed. So the failure of the uh, Occupational Health and Safety Act and uh, other acts that deal with uh, prevention will then culminate into us as the compensation fund having to compensate employees who contract uh, occupational diseases or who gets injured at work. So my presentation will deal with uh, compensation of occupationally acquired COVID-19 disease. And uh, currently what we know about the disease is that uh, it's, it's a type of a, disease, uh, a virus that is called a coronavirus and has the same characteristics with the SARS virus, which is the severe acute respiratory syndrome virus, which was seen some years back in, in China as well. And the incubation period, as we know, is that uh, it takes between five and six days to actually start uh, uh, manifesting symptoms. So the, the range is there is then a zero to 14 days. And the longest viral shedding period to date has been proven to be around 87 days, with the median age at diagnosis being at uh, 59 years. So what we know is that 81% uh, of patients who contract this disease actually remain asymptomatic or have a mild disease and recover with no events. Then 14% develop severe diseases, including pneumonia. And uh, up to 5% become very critically ill with shock and multi-organ failure. And uh, some of uh, those cases end up actually succumbing to, to the disease. And uh, the, the case fatality rate, it's standing at 2%. So the range there is actually 0.2% in those who are under 50 years of age and uh, can go as high as 14.8% in those over eight years. And we also know that uh, older age and uh, pre-existing conditions increase mortality. So if you look at uh, conditions like uh, diabetes, cancer, HIV, chronic lung diseases, and heart diseases, those uh, comorbidities can actually increase the severity of uh, the disease. And uh, we, up to now, we don't have a treatment or vaccine to actually deal with uh, the coronavirus. So everything else is currently under development. So you'll see that uh, in most of my slides, I've uh, tried to touch mostly on uh, some of the clinical aspects of uh, COVID-19, but I'll have, because of uh, time constraints, have to, to actually jump some of the slides that I have. So on the slides, when it, we, we talk about the uh, transmission, we actually refer to the, the transmission from person to person or contact be, uh, with uh, contaminated surfaces. And we know that uh, transmission between person to person is actually through droplets, which are suspended in the air during coughing or sneezing from an infected uh, individual. So that's how uh, COVID-19 is actually transmitted. And uh, it, it does take uh, various uh, clinical stages to present itself. And uh, we have said that uh, up to 81% of those uh, pe people who contract uh, COVID-19 will have uh, mild symptoms and uh, recover without uh, events. And uh, one of the critical things that we actually use when we're looking at compensation is the clinical diagnosis to say that uh, what, how, how was the disease actually diagnosed? So initially, and uh, I think some of uh, the, this is still uh, stands today, is that uh, the diagnosis is made through a sputum, nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal swab specimen that is collected from all patients at uh, admission. And those are tested by real-time polymerase chain reaction for SARS-CoV-2. And uh, in the initial stages, it was said that uh, the testing has to be done within three hours of collection. But we know that uh, in practice, 
that is actually not happening because of uh, different dynamics and uh, all other logistics that uh, each country actually experiences. And uh, there are also tests that have uh, come into the market now. So as a compensation fund, we will actually uh, consider any test that has been used to diagnose the, the coronavirus that has been approved by the Department of Health. And then when you look at the populations at risk, we know that the elderly are mostly at risk, those who are above 50 years, especially so when they are more than 70 years old. And uh, infants and children, although they are not workers, we know that they are also populations at risk because of their immature immune system. And then we have a uh, pregnant and postpartum women because of uh, physiological changes during pregnancy. But we also have uh, those who are immunocompromised, who might also be amongst the workers with uh, HIV, cancer, diabetes, and other immunocompromising conditions. And uh, people with uh, cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, especially when it's not uh, controlled and severe, and uh, other types of heart diseases can actually uh, be at greater risk. Uh, and uh, we have uh, people with uh, chronic lung disease, whether it's uh, COPD, chronic asthma, and especially when it's not uh, controlled. And from an occupational health uh, point of view, we also have uh, people with uh, pneumoconiosis, those who might have uh, asbestosis, silicosis, or coal workers pneumoconiosis, they are also at uh, increased risk of uh, contracting uh, COVID-19. So there are a lot of uh, prevention modalities that have been suggested by the Department of Health and uh, its uh, uh, stakeholders that I'm not going to go through, but uh, I have uh, mentioned some of the modalities that have been uh, suggested in this slide. And uh, with regards to treatment, we know that uh, currently there's no proven treatment or vaccine to date, and that uh, the, what health uh, practitioners are actually doing, they're just uh, providing supportive and symptomatic treatment. And uh, severe cases, they will from time to time maybe need uh, admission to hospital, and that uh, those critical ones then will need uh, ICU or high care admission with or without uh, mechanical ventilation. Now, when it comes to compensation, as the fund for, in terms of uh, section uh, 45 of the Quiet Act, we are required to consider all claims that have been submitted to us and then adjudicate to determine liability. So what we look at when we determine liability is uh, that uh, th there are actually three conditions that we, we look at. The first one being that uh, that disease must have been acquired out of employment. So that means that uh, the employee must have been involved in tasks for which he or she was contractually employed to perform when the disease was uh, contracted. And the second one is that uh, it must have been acquired in the course of employment. So meaning that the disease must have been contracted during the periods when the employee was expected to be performing his or her duties or any other duties in the pursuance of the employer's business. And the last condition is that uh, that person who contracts the disease must be deemed an employee in terms of the Quiet Act or in terms of Section 83 of the Basic Conditions of Employment Act or Section uh, 200A, Subsection 4 of the Labor Relations Act. So that person must fulfill this uh, criteria. So when you look at the compensability of uh, occupational diseases in general, we look at uh, Section 65 and Section 66 of the Quiet Act. So under Section 65, it says that uh, the employee is entitled to compensation if he or she contracts a disease listed in Schedule 3 of the Quiet Act. So Schedule 3 lists uh, uh, the occupational diseases that can actually be acquired in, uh, during work. So if the disease is not listed, but it can be proven that it was acquired in the workplace, liability then has to be accepted by the fund. 
and uh, still under section 65 it says that uh, if a pre-existing condition makes it difficult to treat the occupational disease treatment for the pre-existing condition must also be approved so we we have mentioned that uh, pre-existing conditions and uh, comorbidities can actually make a COVID-19 uh, complicated uh, disease. So in those cases where the pre-existing condition has actually been disclosed and we know about it, then we can actually also approve treatment uh, for that pre-existing condition during the time when uh, the person is admitted to a hospital. And when we also determine permanent disablement, the impact of the pre-existing condition must also be taken into account for the determination of a permanent disablement benefit. And then under that section, we also say that the claim must be submitted within 12 months after the diagnosis of the disease by a medical practitioner. Otherwise, benefits will prescribe. So this uh, conditions must uh, be taken into account. And then section 66 says that uh, an employee who contracts any disease while performing work listed in schedule three is also entitled to benefits under the quiet act. So if the disease is not listed per se in schedule three, but the work that the person was performing is listed there, we can also uh, presume that that disease was actually uh, contracted in the workplace until proven otherwise. And uh, there are certain occupations which will be, of course, more at risk than others. And in the advent of uh, COVID-19, we know that uh, employees who travel frequently on work assignment are more vulnerable to contracting uh, COVID-19 than people who don't travel. And transport and tourism staff will also be more vulnerable, whether it's pilots, cabin crew, professional drivers, tour guides, because of their interaction with uh, various clients, then uh, those people are also at risk. And you're also looking at uh, front desk employees who deal with customers, like in working centers, retail shops, restaurants, even though in this uh, kind of uh, 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 workplaces, the burden of proof is very high, the, those people will be classified as high risk as well. And then you also look at uh, all categories of healthcare workers, including those who are working at in mortuary. They are also high risk of uh, contracting the COVID-19. And you, you, you have uh, academic staff, teachers and lecturers, who are also exposed because of uh, their, the, the type of work that they are doing. And any employee who is actually exposed to infected colleagues, as long as uh, it can be proven that uh, there was an employee who, who had actually tested uh, positive. And then when we look at the medical aspects of compensation, when trying to determine the burden of proof, there are three things that we actually look at. The first thing is uh, causality. So in terms of uh, causality, we say that uh, the agent causing the disease in terms of the hazardous biological agents to which uh, coronavirus belongs must be a known cause of the disease and that the disease suffered must have a causal link to the exposure within the working environment. And when it comes to COVID-19, we can tick this box and say that uh, there's a causality that has been uh, established. And then the second thing that we look at is uh, chronology. That says that the series of events leading to the disease must have a chronological sequence that justifies the link to the cause. So we've talked about the incubation period, how long it takes to, for a person to actually manifest with uh, the disease. So that chronology we also have to establish. You know, there must be an exposure first, and then uh, the incubation period, and then the person must develop the symptoms within that time period, and then and then after that you can then test positive. So if that 
there's that uh, chronology we are able to establish that there's a link between the the the, the disease and the the employee's work and uh, thirdly we also look at uh, medical probability which says that the link between the cause and effect must satisfy the, the requirements for medical probability which stipulates that the likelihood that an association between a cause and an effect be greater than 95 percent for the relationship to be considered probable so with COVID-19 this uh, the medical probability is there so we don't have to do much on this one now there's a a guideline or guidance document that was uh, developed by the Department of Health to actually categorize employees into certain risk uh, categories. So with the slides and the next uh, three slides, I'm just going to go through what is the process of actually determining who will need to be submitted for compensation. Mm -hmm. So in the first instance, we have uh, those we, that we can categorize as category one. So here will be an employee, uh, an employee with a uh, low risk and uh, is suspected uh, COVID-19 exposure, but the person is still asymptomatic. So what needs to happen is that uh, the land manager has to assess the overall COVID-19 exposure risk. And then for low risk exposure or contact with suspected COVID-19 case, employee then has to continue to work. And then the employer will monitor the employee as the employee's uh, temperature on daily basis, as well as other symptoms. And then the land manager or the occupational health uh, staff will need to follow up and obtain index case COVID-19 test result as soon as uh, possible. So if the index case is negative, then there's no further action that is required and the employee has to return to work or, or continue to work. But if the index case is positive for COVID-19 and uh, full PPE was actually worn, then the employee continues to work with daily monitoring for 14 days and then uh, that employee will then have to follow other processes which are characterized, the, uh, I mean, mentioned in category three. And at this point, there's no need to lodge a claim with the compensation fund yet. And then in category two, where you have a, a high risk uh, exposure environment and there's a confirmed COVID-19 exposure, but the worker is still asymptomatic. The land manager has to assess and confirm COVID-19 exposure risk. And then if confirmed to be high risk, then the head of department of, or the one who's responsible need to approve self-quarantine for the, for the employee. And then he need to report staff exposure to NICD and the De Department of Employment and Labor. Then self-quarantine at home at least for a minimum of seven days. And then what needs to happen is that there should be daily symptom self-monitoring till 14 days since, since the last day of COVID-19 uh, exposure. And then these employees, because they have not yet tested uh, positive, they're just uh, uh, exposed to a confirmed COVID-19 exposure case, I, I mean, COVID-19 uh, case, they they need the employer need to evaluate them for early return to work on day eight and if employee remains asymptomatic he can actually return to work and follow work restrictions and if possible uh, if possible COVID-19 symptoms develop then the employer must follow the guidelines given in category three and at this point, again, there's no need to lodge a claim with the compensation fund yet. And now with a category three, those who are at high risk and uh, the worker actually has symptoms compatible with uh, acute respiratory infection. 
the employer has to assess validity of symptoms by a health professional. So this uh, employees need to be referred to a health professional to assess the validity of symptoms. And uh, if that person does not qualify as a person under investigation, uh, the employer then will have to follow the usual sick leave procedures. And then if uh, that person uh, stays well or asymptomatic or I mean, or recovers from the acute respiratory infection, he can then return to work as, as uh, soon as possible when the, the sick leave actually expires. But if that uh, employee start developing the acute respiratory symptoms again, he need to be referred for, for testing. So when the, 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 the test results come back uh, positive, he must then follow category four, which we will outline in the next uh, slide. And then this employee must be reported to the NICD and the Department of Employment and Labor. And now at this stage, the employer must complete the relevant documents and report to the compensation fund. Then for category four, which are employees with at a high risk of uh, contracting uh, COVID-19 and where the employee has actually tested positive for the for the virus, the employer will have then to put the employee on sick leave, report the case to NICD and Department of Employment and Labor, and then the employee have to self-isolate at home if he's mildly, is, uh, mildly symptomatic. And then the index case, if it's a fellow employee or a known COVID-19 confirmed customer, the employer then has to complete relevant documents and report to the compensation fund. And then that employee will then have to return to work 14 days after symptoms onset, if stable. And, and this will only apply to mild and moderate cases. And uh, for those which are severe cases, then the employee will have to return to work 14 days after clinical stability. Now, for us to be able to compensate for COVID-19 in the compensation fund, we have to look at uh, what actually transpired. The first thing that we, we look at is that uh, the clinical diagnosis must be confirmed. And that confirmation must be as the guidelines given by the Department of Health, the WHO, ILO, and uh, we know that uh, currently the, the RT-PCR is the test that is currently being uh, used. But if any test is, up, is approved and is used, then we will consider that as well. And for those who have actually traveled, which was actually the case during the initial stages of uh, COVID-19, we need a proof, a proof of approved official travel or trip to countries or areas affected by COVID-19. And that proof should actually indicate that uh, the person was traveling on work assignment. So the exposure and medical questionnaire must be completed. And where there's no travel history, a known and confirmed case in the workplace as per the criteria above as source of infection. So we actually need to establish uh, the contact tracing information to try to track whether that person has actually contracted uh, the disease in the workplace or, or not. And where there's no source of infection is identified. So if the employer cannot, if the employee did not travel or the employer cannot uh, actually establish the, the contact in the workplace. So that uh, workplace must be presumed to be a high risk workplace in terms of uh, section 66. So we, that's why in the questionnaire that we, we provide, we ask specifically about the sector, the occupation of the, of the employee so that we can establish whether 
that workplace is also classified as a high risk. And uh, for occupations at risk, we have uh, mentioned, uh, uh, we, we have provided guideline in the notice that we have uh, published on the 23rd of March. Now, when it comes to paying benefits for COVID-19 disease, with us as a fund, because there are a lot of uh, processes that actually has to happen before we actually adjudicate on the case, most of the cases that we'll, we'll, we'll provide benefits to will be on a retrospective basis where the case has already been confirmed and accepted as a occupational uh, uh, or workplace acquired. So the fund will then pay medical aid to cover the cost, the cost of approved diagnosis test and clinically appropriate interventions as advised by the Department of Health. And then we will in retrospect also cover the cost of uh, pre-diagnostic measures like quarantine in an approved non-hospital facility where the guidelines that have been followed were actually as an advice of a registered medical practitioner. And then thirdly, the determination of sick leave will also have to be in accordance with the provisions of Section 24 of the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. That basically says that uh, once the, 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 pay, the person has been confirmed to be COVID-19 positive and the, the fund has accepted liability, then whatever sick leave that has, he has been using can actually be converted into occupational uh, sick leave. So what the compensation fund uh, provide under the benefits is that uh, we, we provide medical aid. So medical aid uh, covers reasonable costs for treatment and rehabilitation as provided for by various medical service providers and uh, health establishments. So we pay for everything that the employee needs in terms of the quiet act. And then we also cover the cost towards a temporary partial uh, disablement. So in this case, you'll find that uh, there are people who can actually do certain uh, duties while they're on, on sick leave or while they're taking treatment. So if the employer can reasonably accommodate uh, these employees, then the fund can always cover the, 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 the other, I mean, partially the, the, the earnings of the employee. So this is what we actually call a reasonable accommodation. And we know that uh, currently employees are able to work at home in certain industries and uh, still be able to be productive. Where employees cannot, because of uh, the severity of the disease, cannot do anything, then we'll also pay for temporary total disablement. So this is a payment made directly to the employee while he or she is, remains off sick and it covers a reasonable cost of low cost of lost wages up to 75% of the employee's salary. And we pay that from the fourth day of injury or disease. And for such period as the employee may remain unfit to work, but not exceeding 24 months. So in our notice, we have indicated that uh, this TTD is actually going to be paid for up to three months. I, I mean, for up to 30 days and any extension of TTD will then depend on the severity of the disease in, in, in a particular employee and the complications that actually result from that employee contracting the disease. So we will treat each case on a case by case basis. And then we also pay for permanent disablement, whether it's a lump sum or pension that is paid to employees whose diseases have actually reached permanency and no further improvement or deterioration is envisaged after maximum medical improvement status is actually reached. So mostly if uh, this uh, disease complicates, there might be a, an anatomical loss or functional loss that uh, employees suffer. So if uh, 
those uh, losses are actually proven, then we, we can determine permanent disablement and then pay the employees accordingly. And as the fund, we also pay for death benefits for fatal injuries or diseases. And uh, that will then also include pay independence of the employee an amount not exceeding 100% permanent disablement, which is referred to in section 49, subsection one. And currently as the fund, we pay in funeral costs, which are actually a once of payment of 18,251. So under the, the Compensation for Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act, various uh, benefits that I have mentioned are actually covered under different sections and how we actually calculate them. So the next two or three slides are actually directing employers and uh, their representatives to the relevant sections there to actually indicate what benefit we pay and the nature of that benefit as well as the manner of calculating the benefits. So you'll see that uh, we, we have a TTD and uh, we've given the manner there. And uh, under permanent disablement, we have uh, different ways of actually uh, paying and calculating permanent disablement benefit, which I'm actually not going to go through. Uh, but this slides will provide uh, guidance and uh, when it comes to the forms and documents that we need for us to consider a claim, firstly, we will need the employer's report of an occupational disease. So that is a WCL1. And then the notice of an occupational disease and claim for compensation, that's a WCL14. And we've also included the exposure and medical questionnaire that need to be filled to cover some of the areas which are not uh, covered in the two previous forms. And that we also need a first medical report in respect of an occupational disease. So that is a WCL 22, which must uh, then be filled by a medical practitioner and submitted to the directly to the fund or to the employer, then the employer can then submit the documents to us. And there's also exposure history, which is a WCL 110, or any other appropriate employment history, which may include any information that may, may be helpful to the compensation fund. So these are the initial things that uh, we actually need. And then, uh, of course, we also need the laboratory results, which actually confirms the diagnosis for COVID-19 and any other investigations that actually have been done, whether it be it uh, radiographs or laboratory tests that can actually also assist us in making a, a decision. We need that. So once we have received all these documents, then we are able to adjudicate and move forward with the claim. And then later then, we'll only then need a progress medical report when the employee has consulted the doctor for a second time. And then the final medical report when that patient, uh, the employee has actually recovered. And then uh, in cases which should actually be rare, we also consider an affidavit by the employee if the employer cannot be traced or will not timely supply WCL1. And I know that uh, this will be the rarest case because uh, most employers are actually very compliant. So we hardly ever need an affidavit from an employee. And that's the end of the presentation. Thanks very much.
Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. That was Dr. Uh, Lucas Mussidi. Um, and uh, from the compensation fund dealing with compensation for COVID-19 disease where that is. I just need to just reset our, um, Dr. Mercedes, we are going to deal with uh, uh, some of the questions that have arisen. Um, can you see uh, some of the unanswered questions on your side? Uh, from the Q&A. Yes, yes. Please just uh, click on that particular box. I'm going to ask uh, my two colleagues here also just to join you so that we can um, look at what questions uh, either have already been answered and we may want to highlight and also which questions are there that may be unanswered um, that we don't have to deal with later. So I'm going to ask um, Colin just to join on the side. Okay, let me check. I just want to remind colleagues who are participating that it's important for you to visit our website. It has quite a lot of frequently asked questions that we dealt with before, and as well as all of the resources that some of you were asking for, like presentations, etc. So we will have um, those ones there. So could I then maybe um, I think it was a compensation specific question. I don't know if you found it here, Dr. Masidi. Yeah, that's, uh, I see a question that uh, asked about, about uh, the ICD-10 code. Yes. That actually says whether we're going to accept the U07.2 code post recovery. So we, we, we know that uh, this code is actually used for emergencies, which is the, will be then at the diagnosis of uh, the disease. But once the person has uh, recovered, because in the, in, in the fund we captured that uh, code initially to accept the, the claim and uh, with further uh, progression of the patient, then we update the codes accordingly. So there are various uh, codes that have been uh, uh, proposed by the World Health uh, Organization that uh, can be also submitted, and then we will update on our side. But if it's not uh, submitted, we'll still accept the U07.2, and then we can do the updating on our side. Mm. Uh, Dr. Masili, I'm not sure that very next question, they are uh, expressing concern about the situation a vulnerable person was requested to work even though the medical report was handed in. Uh, I think your slide showing your different uh, scenarios also indicated that under certain circumstances, people might still be required to be at work. Uh, is, is that the case? Yeah, remember, the if a uh, people are still under investigation and the diagnosis is not yet uh, confirmed, then the normal sick leave has to be used. And that will then require a, a report or, or sick note from a medical practitioner. But the compensation fund will only come in when the infection has actually been confirmed. And then we will then uh, change the normal sick leave to now occupational sick leave. Okay. Um, there's the, uh, which specific proof is needed as evidence of occupational acquisition? I think you addressed that in the slide. Uh, the person continues to say we are community beings, commuters, consumers, etc., and also employees. I think it goes to the question of the, the causal link that you raised, Dr. Masili? Yeah, there the, the always need to be a chronology that can actually try to explain how the events actually occurred. 
So the employer needs to indicate in the form to say that uh, during this uh, period, the employee was uh, expected or to perform these duties on a daily basis and then, uh, you know, deal with customers, work uh, close to, with, with uh, other colleagues and, uh, you know, people where he could potentially have uh, acquired uh, the disease. And then the second thing then uh, is that uh, the, maybe there's a known person who actually tested uh, positive within that uh, group. And then if there's no one who has actually tested uh, positive, we'll then look at the workplace to say that uh, in this workplace, is it a high risk workplace where uh, people will actually be dealing with uh, potential cases on a day to day basis. So if someone is in, in a retail space, you know, there you will necessarily not have uh, people who have been confirmed to, to be uh, positive cases, but we know that the industry is actually high risk because of its nature. But okay. the employer has to indicate that the person was working and uh, doing all those things that could have potentially exposed him. Yes, yes. Thanks, Dr. Musili. Uh, there's a question here, uh, the COVID-19 regulations or circular recommends appointment of compliance officer, meaning the roles are taken from the health and safety report the committee. Please clarify. My sense is that the question is asking if the compliance officer replaces the occupation of the safety representative and the occupation of the safety committee. Um, my understanding that's not the case. Okay. I think the important thing here to remember is um, that compliance with the regulations for COVID-19 happen in addition to all your regulations that's been in place mm -hmm. always. Um, teamwork, I think, would be extremely important here. Um, the compliance officer um, will be a manager. The requirement is that the manager must be appointed as the compliance officer. And one of his duties will be to communicate with the um, Occupational Health and Safety Committee. So the, the, the link of, um, of communication and transparency, I think, is extremely mm -hmm. important here. So yes, I think that's a very important point, the Occupational Health and Safety Act and all of its regulations still apply, the Compensation Act and all of its guidelines and directives still apply, and the Occupational Health and Safety Act does make provision for the statutory creature called uh, Health and Safety Committee, that creation is there, as well as the Occupational Health and Safety Representative. The LRA provides for the training of the representative as well, and those legal roles still is in place. I think those are essential structures to ensure that a compliance officer uh, would be able to uh, monitor and ensure that all the contain containment measures for COVID-19 is in fact in place. So that would be critical and the ongoing conversation and discussions and transparency as Carlos uh, has indicated would be very, very important. Um, so uh, there's a question here about budget and funding to prevent the spread of COVID-19 from Jacobus. Um, and uh, if a department has no funding or budget, how can these employees keep working? My sense is Jacobus, that's one of the points that needs to be dealt with in the COVID-19 conversations, the uh, risk assessment that needs to undertake to ensure that prevention is promoted in the workplace. And then, quite clearly, as you've seen in our presentations, the employer then has an obligation to put in place the control measures, the containment measures that's required by such a risk assessment. And that's a conversation that can only happen in your workplace. Please engage uh, uh, through the different stakeholders and forums that that's been the case. So um, we are in the last uh, few minutes of our session, and let's see if we can. Uh, I'm not sure, Dr. Vasili, is there any other questions that you've picked up in the open unanswered category there of the Q&A? Yeah, there's a, one that was talking to a pregnant employee. Please proceed. Whether it's high risk or not. So with a pregnancy, 
it wouldn't matter which stage of pregnancy the employee is at. Pregnancy in itself will be high risk. And we know that uh, there's a code of uh, good practice that actually gives guidance on how employers need to deal with uh, accommodating uh, pregnant employees. And in the advent of uh, COVID-19, those guidelines should also be followed. Yes. Um, Dr. Kumusi, there is one year that talks about the staff may not test it positive before Easter. Uh, that's a while back, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, for the employee only, the employee only returned on the 1st of June after some complications. I would assume that could be health or non-health complications. The employee worked for one week and is now off again with symptoms, probably due, and that's a guess, due to the COVID-19 infection they had. She has tested negative prior to return to work. The sick leave is exhausted, but she's still not well. What should happen in a case like this as she's showing symptoms that can be due to after effects of the initial infection? But from the CD, um, you're the only medical person on hand at the moment. C could you just speak to that one? Yeah, th this one will depend on the, if they say they, he returned, you know, was he on a leave? Mm -hmm. because of the regulations and uh, all that stuff. Because uh, if that person was actually uh, proven COVID-19 positive during leave, that will not be occupational. Uh, so it won't be an occupational case. So if the employer actually reopened on the 1st of June and that person comes back and now he has uh, complications, that needs to be treated then uh, just like any other medical condition where the employee has to consult a medical doctor. If he needs to be booked off, he's booked off. And then if that uh, sick leave then gets uh, exhausted and the employee needs more days to stay off work, then their internal policies have to, to actually kick in. How do they actually deal with a... a what do you call the sickness uh, or incapacity, if I can put it that way. You know, they need to apply the policies uh, taking into cognizant the, the guidelines given in the Basic Conditions of Employment Act as, as well as the Labor Relations Act. Thank you for that, Dr. Musidi. This is one interesting question. Uh, which we won't deal with in any much detail, and then I'll move it away. Uh, from somebody who asks about a full-time shop steward, um, we have a minute for this quickly. Um, what happens in the event an employee becomes a full-time shop steward and his KPA changed and no longer report to his employer but to the union is he covered under that? Uh, I said since you're still an employee of a particular employer, you may have been um, what's the word, uh, seconded to a, uh, an additional role for this period of time. And clearly the agreement between your organization, the union and the employer needs to speak to all of this. Uh, as an employee, uh, you should be uh, protected by the Occupational Health and Safety provisions. And in terms of COIDA, you should be entitled to compensation, but it must be clearly stipulated in that agreement. What are the conditions of your secondment? and what are also the responsibilities uh, and what risk assessment activity uh, speaks to your specific role. So at this point, we've reached the end of today's COVID-19 um, online Zoom uh, seminar, or webinar, apologies. And um, I need to, at first, just say thank you very much to you, Dr. Lucas Mosidi from the Compensation Fund within the Department of Employment and Labor. Dr. Musidi, thank you very much for your contributions and answering questions of the participants. We are glad to join us today. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. And then, obviously, to our two uh, presenters of the NIH, that's Michelle Morgan from the uh, SHE Department, the National Deputy Manager of the SHE Department. Thanks, Michelle, for making your contributions. Yeah. Much appreciated. And currently, from the NIH Occupational Hygiene uh, section, which I'll thank, uh, sorry, Karen, did I just call you Michelle? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Karen, 
Thank you very much for your contribution. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. And then to the team, um, there's just one. Uh, if you see on the screen there, I think this is one connection to that, which I've unfortunately now not brought about. That's important uh, resources for you to have. Uh, if you go to that slide again, please just change people. If you have a pin, uh, change the hotline number there of. Um, 0800-111-132 to our hotline, which is, is it there? No. Uh, 0800-212175. I will just amend that slide for our next webinar. But there you can see all the important uh, places you can find very useful COVID-19, workplace preparedness and prevention resources. And right on the top is the website I've been recommending to you all the time where the resources are. At the bottom, on the corner on the right hand side, is the email address. If you have any follow up questions, we will address unanswered questions as soon as possible. These are normally posted on our website under the frequently asked questions. And if there's something very burning and urgent, please email that email address info at nih.ac.za. Phone us at 0800 212175 if it's very urgent. At this point in time, I need to thank you for joining today's uh, partnership webinar between the Visal Consortium and the National City for Occupational Health, funded by the Health and Welfare Center. Uh, thank you and goodbye.